Hi, welcome to The Real Estate of Mind Show with your hosts, Glenn and Amber. Hey, everybody. We help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We have a great episode lined up for you today, and let's get rocking and rolling. So today's hot topic is the top five mistakes people make when they start out in real estate Ooh. investing. Number one, you think you have to do all the work yourself. Very common mistake, and one that we originally had as we were discussing how do we start this business on our first house and how do we how do we figure that out? We thought we had to do all the work ourselves to make all the money. Right. So why is this a mistake? First of all, you can only be in one place at a time. So if you're wanting to do multiple deals, you can't you simply can't be everywhere at once. Yeah. Um, number two, you know, it's important to leverage your time. That kind of goes right along with number one. But um, and number three is if you're so busy doing the work at a house, you can't go out and find your next deal. You have to wait until you're done with that house before you even start looking for the next deal. And yeah, that takes months usually oh, to yeah. find and close all that, all those things. Right. You want to do the things that are going to make you money, not the thing. You know, th there's there's task in any business, whether it's you know you're the CEO of a company and you need an assistant to do the the lower paying things so that you can keep that you know 500 foot view of what's going on in your or company. Or 5,000 foot, 5, foot view. 500 is not very high. Yeah, that's 5, true. <laughs> Shut up. 50,000, what people like to say as a <laughs> Thank CEO. Thank you for making fun of me in front of a ton of people here. So. Your five-foot view. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm five. <laughs> Whatever. Right. Shut up. All right. Um, manual labor is not going to... Are you done? <laughs> I'm done now. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. So manual labor is not going to help you grow or reach your goals in real estate investing, but looking for the next deal will. Yeah. So what should you do? So hire a contractor, right? Hire it out. Again, when you start off, on paper, it makes sense. On paper, you say, if I did all this work myself, look how much money I could save. But you're not actually saving money. So really consider hiring things out, hiring contractors out. Um, hire the things that you're weak at. If you are really weak at any aspect, I am fortunate to have one of the best designers in the country right here. I had to make up for that last little slam. <laughs> you better. That was smooth, wasn't it? That was a smooth segue <laughs> Yeah, I segue saw that coming, that. like, I saw that coming way ahead, yeah. Yeah, but I still did it. So I get some, <laughs> I get a half a point for it. So, you know, she loves, she, but she is, a, all, all kidding aside, she's one of the best designers, in my opinion, in the country. And she's fantastic at it. But um, if I didn't have her, I'd have to hire that out because I am not a good designer, right? I mean, look at me. Clearly, I'm not a great designer. So it's not something that I'm... He's a work in progress. It's not something that I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I deserve that. So anyways, guys, I just want to make sure you know, hire out what you're not good at, okay? If you're not good at something, hire it out. That's really important to do. Um, and, you know, save yourself time wherever you can. Because like Amber said, you want to put your efforts on the higher dollar activities. That's where you want to put your efforts. The higher your effort or the, the, the higher dollar dollar um, projects that you put your time on, the better return you're going to have on your time. Yep. You know, but we did have that when we first started, like Glenn was saying in the beginning, we thought we had to do all the work ourselves. But the first three houses that we did, we actually oh. did do almost all of the work ourselves. I think we hired out a couple things like the hardwood floors and whatever. But, you know, we got we got sick. Um, I remember the, Wearing yourself the, the bone. Yeah. Um, that one hoarder house that we did, there were three layers of carpet and the lady had Alzheimer's that lived there and she had yeah. multiple dogs and yeah. um, we peeled up you the, had that a real, carpet. You had a real bad respiratory There was thing, so, right? like, so much mold in the carpet that when we peeled the carpet up, I, I was sick for several months. Yeah, we didn't know enough. That. We just ripped the carpet back and that dust went in yeah, the air and you were sick. Everywhere. Yeah, and then the very I, first house we did, you hurt your back. The second house, that was the second house on uh, over Stoodley. on Jerry. No, Jerry. No, I remember oh, it, it well. Jerry? Yes, okay. yeah. It was oh, Jerry. under the yes, sink. Yeah. That's right. I, if, you, if you've ever done any sink work, you'll know. And I'm not a contractor, but I was hungry, needed money, so I thought I was going to make money doing this. I was putting a sink. Now, if you ever put a, a kitchen sink faucet in, there's no way for a short, stubby arm like this to get up there, you know. So I had to get my arm in the back and do it. I was bent over the <clears> back, <throat> and my back was on that little lip on the bottom cabinet, and something went. <clears throat> kind of snapped in my back and you know it's been 13 years and never my back has never been the same ever I've had problems ever since then and so yeah I think about the hurt back I remember that so yeah so you know we paid with our health even by doing stuff oh yeah like that. and then the other thing is we were exhausted we were burning the candle at both ends so you know yeah. had we had we known enough had we had a coach that told us don't do the work yourself and hired that out we would have probably made the same amount of money <laughs> Could have saved all that money on therapy, too. <laughs> Fighting all the time. Yeah, you, when you're exhausted, everything everything's amplified, yeah, right. you know? What do you want for dinner? What is that supposed to mean? Am I fat? <laughs> so, you know, you wind up fighting about nothing. It's just crazy. But exhaustion. That was you saying that. Right? I know. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, um, once we decided, it was about our third or fourth job, 
We had multiple jobs going, but once we made the decision to start to delegate and hire out, every decision you make in life is always kind of a tough spot when you first make it. And so we made that decision to hire out. We hired out a tile guy, who was our friend mm -hmm. of ours. We hired out a tile guy. Then we hired a painter. And then we hired someone to put the kitchen cabinets in because we didn't want to do it ourselves. And then we hired a countertop guy. And slowly, but, but we were scared. Mm -hmm. We hired contractors out. But we found is that we were getting jobs done better. Our business grew. We could do multiple projects at the same time. That, I think, was really important. And we were happier and more free because now we were managing projects as opposed to doing projects. And our future looked brighter because we had more possibilities instead of saying, I'm working on this one and I can't do anything until I get this one done and sold to move to this one. And we have limited growth. Where Once we started to delegate, we had more like unlimited growth. Yeah, I think there's always like some fear that comes along, whether it's hiring a contractor, or whether it's hiring someone in your business or whatever. It's like, oh my goodness, all of a sudden I have this salary or this wage I have to pay. Yeah. So, you know, am I going to have enough money to do it? But It's always a common fear. When that person can make you more money than they're costing, Yeah then it's a no-brainer. Totally. It's a total win-win. So number two, thinking you can do it on your own without coaching, training, or a mentor. Yeah. Um, this is a, a huge mistake. You know, the school of hard knocks does not pay very well at all. <laughs> um, She's expensive Ask us how too. we know that. Yeah, very, very, very expensive. <laughs> we, we started out that way <clears throat> and then we quickly understood and realized that we needed to get some education. Yeah, again, school school of hard knocks looks good on paper. Just mm -hmm. like just like doing the work yourself on a renovation looks great on paper, but in reality, it limits your growth. Same exact thing with hiring a mentor or a coach to work with. If you don't have that, you are going to pay. You're going to pay in time, mistakes, money. You're going to pay in all that. So you're going to pay one way or the other. But one's a happier journey than the other. Yeah, and honestly, the cost of the education will save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because if you try to go about this without education, you're going to pay with both time and money. Yeah. Because the mistakes you're going to make are going to cost you both. Yeah. So the, the cost of the education is really a no-brainer because it's going to save you all of that time and money plus all of the headaches that go along with that. And, and you know, maybe even... Well, positively, it will get you off on a better track because if you're building the track as you go along, yeah. that takes a lot longer and it's a lot harder than if you have a track to run on. Yeah. Huge difference. Yeah. Huge difference. Um, you know, like I was saying about that track, if you're running on the one that somebody else has laid, it shaves years off of the learning curve. Yeah. That's the biggest part with having, having a mentor. You're writing a check to shave time. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. You hire a mentor to shave time. And at the end of the day, our lives are about time. We all have a finite amount of time on this planet. If you look at that at a, on a global scale, we have a finite amount of time. And so writing a check shortens the learning curve. Short, and hopefully it will dramatically decrease the risk. Because what we do is risky, but it'll decrease risk because now you have someone there to help you and guide you through tough decisions. And that's a, that's a big part of it. Yeah, and if you're getting in real estate, you obviously have some goals that you want to reach that you're not reaching where you are at your life right now. So yeah. do you want to reach those goals more quickly or do you want to stretch them out over years and years and years? and pay the price of right. school hard knocks along the way. And right. that's that's the challenge part. So right. what should you do instead? Again, we said getting a, getting a coach, a trainer, a mentor, that's important. Um, you know, if you think about it this way, the best business people in the world, the best athletes in the world in all sports have what? Coaches. Coaches. Right? Trainers. They have trainers. Yeah. They have coaches. There's a reason why, you know, Tiger Woods at one point, he's almost again getting close again to be number one in the world. Um, there's a reason why he has a coach, a swing coach. He has an exercise coach. He has all kinds of coaches. Those guys have chefs. They have a lot of people that help them get there. So you start where you can start and get yourself off the right on the right path. When we started, we went to some trainings. When we first started, we drove a couple hours, went to a, a day training, bought a course. And the course was good. It gave me a form that I wanted, the same form we yeah. give away for free now, but our, the, our home flipping uh, evaluator. And we had talked to people that had done it locally, but when we hired, and that was all okay. But once we hired a coach, um, that took our business to the next level. I had somebody I could call and say, I have a situation, how is this? I, I have a situation that I've been through, have you been through that? And almost always a good coach has been through those similar situations and they can give you techniques and guide you. And suddenly you shorten a learning curve where you could have made a mistake that you would have paid for for six months Two months, or six months, a year, or even two years, you would have paid for that mistake. But having a coach can shorten that to a one, you know, five-minute conversation, and you avoid making that mistake in the first place. You know place. what I was just thinking while you were talking? How awesome I am! Yes, of course, honey. <laughs> 
Um, you know, we've talked in a lot of our other podcasts about how we got therapy and how it really helped our relationship. And you can go out and read all of the marriage or relationship or self-help books that are on the market today. But there's a big difference when you actually have a therapist, somebody that can hold the mirror in front of your face, or if you have a particular problem that you're dealing with, and that's addressed directly instead of on a broad scale. You know, that's the difference of, you know, just trying to go out and learn it on your own versus yeah. having a coach in real estate. Coaching, the last thing I'll say about this is coaching is personal. So when you read in a book, and listen, I've read hundreds of books on self-improvement and success and real estate investing and all different types of, of business success, and that's all great. But there's always those specific questions that are the game changers for you. It's those questions that aren't quite answered in a book. You, you yeah. think to yourself, that's, boy, chapter four kind of resonates with me, but I just wish they understood my situation. Because I think if they knew my situation, they, their, their answer might be a little different. And you're probably right. If your gut's telling you that, you're probably right, but you have no one to go to because you can't write the author and say, so my situation's a little bit different. What do you think about that? Write a different chapter. He's going to say, yeah, whatever. But my point <clears throat> is that... When you have a coach, it's very personal. They're going to help you move to the next level, and that's what that's what changed our lives. And we just recently actually just joined a mastermind that's not inexpensive at all. It's a, it's tens of thousands of dollars per year, um, but it's around people that are operating at our level. So these are people that are doing at least 50 deals a year, and many of them are doing hundreds of deals per year. And we just spent the past four days with them in San Diego. And it was fun to be around people that are operating at a different level because there, suddenly they become our peers and our coaches. And we can have these conversations in this mastermind to become better at what we do. And there's a reason we invest in ourselves. We want to be better and we're going to be better. And so we know that by hiring people and getting around the right people, hiring coaches, hiring mentors, that'll take us there. All right. Sorry. Absolutely. So... Number three is overdoing the renovation. This happens so often, especially when you're getting started and you're brand new because um, and at our home flipping workshop, every time we go out and do our bus tour, we come back and we actually evaluate the property and we have a lot of um, student participation with that, you know, what would you do with the house and that sort of thing. So we can actually put on paper how much the renovations are gonna cost. And every single time people want to overdo the renovation because they're making the house what they would want it if they lived there. Yeah. And it may be that you buy a house that, that can fit that, but not all houses are like that. And when you're investing in a house, when you're a real estate investor, you need to really come at it at, at a very systematic approach and base your decision on the comps of that particular house and not overdo it and not underdo it either. Because if you're doing a high-end remodel, you know, you definitely want to put the higher end stuff. And sometimes that might even be nicer than what you live in yourself, which can be like, you know, hey, I'm a little jealous of that. But it's, it's a big rookie mistake to either most of the time overdo the house and then you're just not going to get what you put into it. So just to kind of go pre her, her answer there, you know, why is it a mistake? Well, it's a mistake because you'll never get the money back out of it that you put into it. So if you over renovate a house, you, you just won't get your money back. Because like I've, I've said before is that a house is only worth what someone is willing and able to pay for. Now, why do I say that? Willing and able. Because there's always the neighbor that says, I'd give you 150 grand for that house today. I say, great. Did they give it to you? No. And then they're not able to. And people that people that aren't able to pay for a house, typically they're the ones that are willing to pay full price for a house, right? So I always say a house is only worth, worth what someone is willing and able to pay for it. Um, and the buyer is going to pay what it's worth. They don't care what you put into it or what you have to get out of it. So just keep that in mind. But like what Amber said is very true. Um, that's important. Maybe talk about the, the bathroom at Jerry Ave. We can kind of talk about that together if you want. Or not, it wasn't Jerry, it was uh, Riggy. But yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk about that in a minute, though, because, you know, I want to tell them what they should do instead. Okay. So I think you already did, but okay. Well, go ahead. I said you want to base it on the comps. I did mention that. That's yep. very important. But you also want to know your area. That's really important too because not everything like like it's kind of like taking information from a book. It's a very broad um, understanding of something, but when you know your specific area, you know what to do. So, for example, here in New York, if I'm re renovating a house that has a hundred and fifty thousand dollar after repair value, I'm not going to put granite and high end appliances in it. For example, um, actually, my limit up here in upstate New York is if the house is two fifty or above, I put granite. If it's two fifty or below, I, I'll do a laminate countertop. And there might be a little wiggle room between two hundred and two fifty. Does the neighborhood in that kind of does. stuff? But most of the time, and, and it depends on the comps. Um, but True. in Texas, where I'm originally from, you get a lot more for your money. I, I would, you know, those houses, my house I sold for, it was in Grapevine. It was like two streets from the lake, if anybody's from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
um, and that house sold for about $300,000. And up here in New York, my house would have been easily a half a million dollars. So you get a lot more for your money there. So there you'd put higher end um, finishes even in a lower cost house. So you wanna know your area. Know your area, know your area, know your area so that you're putting the right things in. <coughs> we did a house um, early on in our career and I remember making this bathroom. Amber, uh, there, was, there was a closet and we decided to make it a bathroom. And when you made it this beautiful bathroom, it had a standalone jacuzzi tub, yeah. tile all around, surround, dark wall that was not popular back then. We had a, it, you it was know, very spa-like. It was yes. a spa. That, yeah. you, and then we had a, we had a stand-up tile shower. Yeah. Um, did the I believe that we bought that we had a little name for it. We won't say it on the podcast. We had a elephant, uh, but it, but that was the remember the big huge faucet that came out. We bought that special faucet. It was oh. like three hundred. Remember that? Yeah, thing? yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. called it an elephant uh, part, but it was it was enormous. This thing that came out. We were laughing about it the whole it time. It made more of an impression on him <laughs> than me, apparently. Was, I had nightmares, <laughs> so it was kind of scary. So this. Uh, but we remember we bought that though. As yeah. we're talking about thinking about that big huge thing, and we had to make it look beautiful, come out of the wall. Everything was great. We overdid it. It didn't get that much more money for the house. We really overdid it. And you know, what was unique about that house, though, is it wasn't even just that it was overdone. People in that neighborhood actually didn't think they deserved something that nice because the house wasn't really like. overpriced. But no, we had some feedback like that. Like, that's too nice for me. You know, my friends would, like, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 that's it, it right. Was, it was a that's very. has been a long time ago. I remember that. Yeah, I should say that. Really, yeah, it was really a unique situation. Yeah, strange. Yeah. Strange. All right. Number four. Number four is not counting all of your cost. Um, why is this a mistake? Because it can kill your deal <laughs> very, very quickly. Totally. We see it happen. You know, people make an emotional decision. Um, and I say that all the time. We talk about that in our workshop. Not even emotional. They just for, they forget the, they forget the actual cost. Emotional yes, too, though. But but it's very very common for people to make emotional decisions. You know, they're so excited. They they find a deal. They just know they want it. Gotta that get has the first to be the one. one. They'll Gotta do, get the first one. They'll do eraser math to make it work. Even yeah. um, that's an emotional decision. We teach to make business decisions. You know, lay it out on paper. Make sure the numbers work. Make a business decision on a house, um, and you want to base that on facts. Yeah. You know, count all of your costs. Don't base it on emotions. Make sure that when you're doing this, you figure out all of your costs in the house. Now, what I mean when I say all the costs, there are silent, I call it the silent killer of real estate deals. Things like taxes. You don't pay that. Remember, you pay tax every day you own a house. You pay interest payments on your lender, whether it's a private lender or a bank or wherever you're, you're getting your money. Even if you're borrowing it from yourself from a 401k, you're paying interest on that money every single day you own it. You don't feel it coming out because you're maybe not making a monthly payment. But you're going to feel it when you get to the closing table, your utilities, all the maintenance costs, all those things. I always talk about the risk of owning a house too long, too. If you're in good old upstate New York, as we're recording this, it's actually the middle of winter time up here with, you know, there's two foot of snow outside. Pipes can freeze the longer you own a house. There's things that can happen the more that you own a house. Those are all silent killers of deals. And so it's important that you figure all those costs in um, on a house. One of the worst case scenarios we have was a house that we had who our holding costs were were extraordinary. We had the house up on, we bought it, we, we rented a beautiful 4,000 square foot home that was uh, contemporary on 57 acres of land. Yeah. And the lawn, I think, was like four acres. And the driveway was like almost a third of a mile up a steep hill. Well, to mow that lawn, by the time he finished mowing the lawn, he had to go back and start again because by the time he finished, it was already growing in the in the first part. I think it was four hundred dollars a piece every time he had to mow the lawn. He'd start four hundred bucks back, start again, four hundred bucks. It, it, it never stopped. Was it, was it really that much? Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it took him it took oh him a week to gosh. mow the lawn. Yeah, we had a, yeah we had a little push board with little blades in it. He just pushed it. Just shut up. <laughs> so, but no, it took a long time. And then we had the guy that plowed the driveway. That was a third of a mile, and he shoveled it. <laughs> no, it was a flop. But even that was about three hundred dollars every time it had to. In that one year, it snowed a lot. So we our our whole and our heating costs on a four thousand square foot home were extraordinary, especially in the winter time. So that was a brutal winter. Well, the holding costs ate us alive on that house. And so we've learned the hard way that you have to figure costs. When you have a bigger house, you're going to have more holding costs. The, if a house is more expensive and larger taxes and more to heat and more to maintain, you're going to have more holding costs. So figure in, you know, four months, six months, eight months of holding time and be realistic about it and figure that cost in because that's the cost that can kill you if you're not paying attention to yep. it. So. so number five <clears throat> is mismanaging the job and or the sale. So mismanaging the job or the sale. Um, 
Why is it a mistake? Well, it's a mistake because you're going to lose money if you don't do it properly, right? If you're not managing your job properly, managing the sale properly, you're going to lose money. So time is money. We just talked about holding costs uh, prior to this, right? Well, holding costs, every day a house costs you money. On average, a house is anywhere from $50 to $100 per day that you own a house. So that's going to cost you that much money. So every time you're managing a job and you're getting off schedule, it's going to cost you money. Every day is an extra $100. Now you may say, that doesn't sound like much. If you're two months overdue, that's thousands of dollars. I hate to tell you, that's about $3,000 a month that you're losing in holding costs. And if you think, well, I wouldn't go two months over, it can happen. You blink your eyes if you manage a job incorrectly, especially when you have multiple projects, that can happen to you, all right? Um, and so we always spend a lot of time with our students going over this topic and how to manage that. What I say to you is this, if you want to, managing the job correctly and the sale, when I say the sale, I mean when you, when you go under contract with a house, you want to make sure that sale happens quickly too because it could take 30 days to close or it could take 90 days to close depending on that process. And if you're managing your lawyers and managing all that, we teach our students, listen, pretend that every day, you know, a bill collector comes to your door and says, good morning, I need $100 today, and you pay them. And the next day, good morning, you need $100, and you pay them. And the next day, good morning, $100. Good morning, $100. Good morning, am I annoying yet? Good morning, $100. Good morning, am I annoying yet? Because that is what you have to feel. You have to be that annoyed and understand that every day you're like, stop coming to my friggin' door, man. Well, you owe me 100 bucks today, period. I don't care, right? Pay me. And if you think of it that way, you'll treat your job differently. If you put that much priority and emphasis on it, you'll manage those processes better so you can put that money in your pocket instead of everybody else's pocket that doesn't care. Okay? Yeah, part of our evaluator is that um, we actually call it a burn rate. You know, know what your burn rate is, your yeah. daily, weekly, and your monthly burn rate. Because if you think about that, you know, I'm losing $100 or $150 or $200 a day. If that's not a motivator to get things done quick, I don't know what is. Yeah. So um, what should you do instead? First of all is create a rock solid scope of work. That's something that all of our students get. Um, they can be a little bit time consuming to do, but if it's so worth the time that you take to, to create that scope of work. We call it our contractor's Bible. It saves, you know, all the phone calls and headaches and everything's in there. Sure. Um, next is hold your contractor accountable to a deadline. Um, so that the job doesn't drag on and on and on. Um, and one way to do that is have benchmarks built right into the scope of work and the phases of work that need to be done. And the payment schedule is tied to that too. You know, when um, I think our scope <coughs> of work has six different phases, you know, there's like demo and prep and then there's rough end plumbing and electrical and paint and flooring and setting the cabinets and punch out and all that kind of stuff. So they know exactly when they're done with phase one or phase three that they get this amount of money. And that keeps the money from getting ahead of the work. Very, very important. Don't put up with shit. And you yeah. will deal with it with contractors. I'm gonna flip my notes here because this is something that I think is important. Um, new investors can lack confidence. So people and contractors potentially or especially can tend to want to walk over you. Um, don't forget who the boss is. And I see this a lot with new people and yeah. our students is the contractor, you know, tells mm -hmm. them, well, you should do this or you should do that or you should replace this railing out front with nice vinyl railings when really all they needed to do for, for that particular flip to make it sell and have good curb appeal is to paint the existing railing that's there and that's going to cost them a lot less than putting a new vinyl railing in. If you I, show fear and you show like oh, in, what should I do? indecision, yeah. ask, ask for advice and say, what are your, what, what are your, instead of having, instead of having being like, oh, you think I should, they, they'll smell that fear. And yeah. So if you say, give me your opinions and I'll let you know my decision. That's a simple way to do it. Right. But I, you know, we see that happen over and over again, and I tell people, don't forget who's boss. You're the one that yeah. still makes the decision. Don't get pushed around. Because, you know, they have a vested interest in wanting to upsell you to other stuff because sure. they make more money on yeah. it. So quick, good story and bad story. The good story is we had a house we did that we bought, renovated, literally had the contractors waiting day one. Um, we finished closing and said, go. And they were already in the house doing what they had to do. Boom, boom, boom. They went, um, we did a renovation, sold the house, closed on the sale 51 days start to finish. Our holding time was like four grand for all expenses. That included a pretty high interest rate back then. Our profit, about $45,000 in that deal. Had another deal, the deal I just talked about with all those holding costs with the, the two, four acre lawn and a third of a mile driveway and all that. 
That house, our holding costs were extraordinary. We sold that house for about 678,000, I think, or 600,000, whatever it was, close to $600,000, I believe it was. Our profit on that deal, $4,000, right? On a job that size, you should make a whole lot more. Now, we didn't lose money because we bought it right, but our holding cost ate us alive. Managed correctly, we should have made well over 100 grand on that, on that, uh, on that job. So, you know, managing your holding costs is key. Yep. All right. So let's recap. You Number one is you think you have to do all of the work yourself. Two, thinking you can do it all on your own without coaching, training, or mentor. Number three is overdoing the renovation. Four is not counting all of your costs. And number five is mismanaging the job. You know, we would love to hear your feedback in the comments. I would really love to hear what mistakes you've made <coughs> along the way, what you did yeah. to fix them, or even what mistakes you're afraid of making. Yeah. So you deserve to live your best life. And the truth is you deserve to be wealthy also. And, you know, Amber and I are very grateful to have the life that we have. <clears throat> it's, really, it's really come through real estate investing yeah. and through, you know, working on each other and, and growing as well. That's for, been very important. But the financial side has been taken care of through real estate investing. And we have, you know, taken on that mission to really share this with other people because our, our mission is helping everyday people create wealth through real estate investing, be able to enjoy life like we have. And if you're an existing investor, we want to help you scale your business. So if you say, listen, I'm doing you know three deals a year, five deals a year, 10 deals a year, and I think I'm killing it. And you say, well, how are you doing 75 deals a year? We can help you get to that level too. And um, you know, we just, we like to help you do that. And if, if, if you want to learn more about us, now we can help you reach out to us, see if we're a good fit. If we are, we'd love to help you take your business and your life to the next level. Absolutely. So you have been listening to the Real Estate of Mind show. We are your hosts, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. And if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you leave a review for it on iTunes and make sure that you follow us on all of the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all of that good stuff. You can find us under Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Remember, everyday people really do create wealth through real estate investing. The only question is, will you be the next one? We'll see you soon. Bye.